Thanks for joining us and welcome to the fifth signature EPN event. My name is Jeff Sharp. I'm the director of the School of Environment and Natural Resources and um, the school has been hosting this event for a good number of years here. We're excited that we had nearly 800 folks registered for tonight's uh, event. Uh, I welcome you that if you're newcomers to our EPN events, this is uh, an annual event we have in um, near Earth Day each uh, April. But we do have ongoing presentations during the course of the year in the uh, um, uh, morning breakfasts and there's topical sort of uh, themes that we cover. Uh, great programs. If you would like to learn more about that on your program, there should be information on how to join uh, the EPN and become get part of our list. Um, email list, epn.osu.edu is the uh, address to which you can sort of sign up. This is an exciting evening for the School of Environment and Natural Resources. We're kicking off our um, um, 50th anniversary. 1968, the School of Environment and Natural Resources was founded at Ohio State University. And today we are celebrating a year-long event to sort of uh, honor and respect our past. We appreciate those of you that have attended uh, our earlier reception celebrating this event, but please look forward to future events where we're gonna be talking further about what uh, the school has done in the past and what we plan to be doing in the future. During this event, we'll be releasing a series of posters showcasing key areas of focus that the school has focused in on um, since 1968. The posters include soils, wildlife, forestry, water, and tonight's poster, The Human Dimensions of the Environment, will be released. Uh, this poster focuses on human interdependence and connections with the environment as a place not only of enjoyment and refuge, but also as a resource to be responsible and sustainably managed for generations to come. These are featured in the social media press walls uh, in the back of the room. I hope some of you use these walls to write out what your vision for a sustainable environment looks like 50 years from now. And I think if you're in Briar and Lauer's class, ENR 2100, you, some of you probably were tap, um, uh, taking some Instagram selfies with it. Um, we appreciate uh, um, Brian Lauer's uh, students uh, participating in tonight's event. At the end of our program, our staff will be in the hallway to hand you a special full-size print of our first commemorative poster. I think we're gonna project, did we project it up there already? Anyway, so there's posters. You'll get them when you leave, and, um, and we uh, ask you to proudly display those in honor of our 50th anniversary. And if you come to later events, there are going to be collector's items, we think. So uh, um, you might come to future events and get some of those future posters. But we're only going to release those at those special events. So today, it's Human Dimensions that we're celebrating. What an incredible opportunity for such an exciting program that explores sustainability through the lens of reinvention. We have some ex exceptional speakers lined up tonight. In the program, you will see that Ohio State's Executive Vice President Provost, Dr. Bruce McFerrin, was scheduled to share some remarks, but unfortunately, Provost McFerrin is battling illness and unable to join us tonight. I'm sure if he was here, he would uh, uh, regale us with tales of his uh, commitment to sustainability. Uh, Bruce was actually my uh, uh, boss for the first, he actually hired me in my role as the Director of the School of Environment and Natural Resources, and I know his commitment to sustainability and that of Ohio State University in general is quite authentic. We've had quite a few activities going on, on at Ohio State the last couple years related to this topic. Uh, Ohio State has articulated some sustainability goals, and you can sort of look to those uh, uh, on our OSU website. We also have this exciting partnership with NG Axiom, otherwise known as the Ohio State Energy Partners, that's going to transform our campus in terms of the way we use energy, as well as um, allowing us to sort of invest in, in energy, uh, sustainability, environmental topics in a way that we've never done before. Uh, we look forward to sharing more of the stories, the success we have had with this partnership, and I'm sure we'll cover this in future EPN events. I also can report to those of you from the community that um, Ohio State has made a very serious commitment in terms of faculty hiring in this area of sustainability. Just in the last uh, three years, through our Discovery Themes initiative, we've hired over 40 faculty to Ohio State, new faculty uh, with an expertise in some topic related to uh, sustainability of the environment uh, and um, the host of related issues. These are faculty that are hired across departments, so it ranges from the humanities to engineering. Uh, we have some in public health. We have faculty in, in my college of food, agricultural, environmental sciences. And so, uh, for those of you that are students here, um, hopefully you'll have a chance to be exposed to these new faculty, but for those in the community, as you're talking to potential students, refer them to Ohio State. We have a strong faculty that are very committed to this, so um, I am delighted to report to you that uh, this is a, uh, um, a major commitment on the, state, the uh, university's part, and as a, as a entity with a vested interest in this I, and a community member, I'm delighted to sort of see this. I'm thrilled to see so many students here this evening. It's great to sort of see the interest. Thank you for those of you that presented your posters outside, and uh, I heard very good reports. Uh, the dean of my college was very impressed with some of the things she saw, and she was actually telling me about how we need to route these to various decision makers at Ohio State to uh, uh, see that uh, uh, some of those ideas are acted upon. So uh, your work is very much appreciated. 
Uh, we also want to thank the President's Provost Council on Sustainability for their strategic advisement on the integration of sustainable practices, programs, and projects across the university, and to the Office of Energy and Environment for their support for tonight's program. I also want to thank a few people from my community that really helped make this happen, Joe Campbell and Molly Hardesty, uh, Molly Bean, who's uh, been helping promote this. I want to acknowledge Kate Barter, Gina Langan from the Office of Energy Environment for their support of this. Um, these kind of events are not easy to, to host, but um, um, we really have a great team here that's committed to sort of making these things happen, so I appreciate your efforts. So Ohio State is fortunate to welcome our first speaker in tonight's moderator, Dr. Nadia Zaksambiva. I'm sure I did not pronounce that right, and I'm told that even in the program we've abbreviated her name because there's actually more letters in her last name than actually appear there. So, um, But we're delighted to have um, uh, Nadia here. She is the Chief Reinvention Officer at the We Exist Reinvention Agency. Nadia's full bio is listed in the program, and I highly recommend taking a look at the resources she shares at her website sometimes. Her career and experience embodies a pathway that we can learn greatly from as we as a university seek to reinvent aspects of ourselves and our processes to become a more environmental, environmentally and financially sustainable and socially just institution. As an author, Nadia has written two books and contributed to five others that advise on efforts to reinvent corporate approaches to sustainability strategy. Nadia and her co-author, Chris Laszlo, coined the concept embedded sustainability which was virtually non-existent when they coined the term in 2009. Today, it produces over 25 million Google search results and has become a staple for corporate sustainability efforts everywhere. When Joe Campbell and Neil Drobny introduced this idea for a panel, they were very clear that not only is Nadia an incredible thought leader in the sector, but she's also an amazing facilitator and a person to learn and share ideas with. You're going to have the opportunity this evening as Nadia builds into our program some very engaging conversations using social media and other methods between audience and panelists, panelists and panelists, and audience to audience. By par participating in this program using this event, hashtag EPN Signature 18 via Twitter, we have it up there, um, you will be registered into a drawing to have lunch with Nadia. So we're looking to sort of like, uh, yeah, it's, us old folks are trying to understand social media here, so this is our way of trying to engage you through, th through those techniques. But um, if you want to sort of like post to the hashtag, we're going to put your name in a drawing and Joe's going to announce the winner. Lunch with Nadia is a great time to get career advice on working in the sustainability sector or how to build your own brand and identity in sustainability and reinvention. So even if you're not a millennial, you can sort of get in the game here. So, uh, um, so I don't want to preclude the, uh, the older generation here, too. She will share additional instructions during her presentation, and EPN Director Joe Campbell will announce the winner at the end of this evening's program. Again, we encourage you to communicate during this program on Twitter using the hashtag EPNSignature18, and I wish you all the luck in the contest. Without further delay, please give a big Buckeye welcome to Dr. Nadia. Thank you so much, Dr. Sharp. So happy to be here, the Ohio State University. This is like the monumental event for me, as I'm a big Buck fan. fan. If any of you are in football, I, I, I need an autograph of some sort. Uh, very happy to be here also with EPN, an amazing network. And it was such a pleasure to imagine this event and reinvent it as well to think about more interactivity, to have a time to have conversations. And I hope you're game for that. Is that okay? That you will actually engage with us. My job for the beginning is to share a little bit on the theme, sustainability through reinvention. And of course, welcome the amazing uh, presenters that shared the stage with me from three really remarkable companies. But I want to first speak about my own story with reinvention and to start with a big confession. So I'm here for the Environmental Professional Network, and I am really a newcomer in the field. Uh, if you think about my professional background and what I do most of the life, I am not coming from the environmental studies. I really come from the field of business. So if we look at our slides and see the story that I share in terms of reinvention and the topic of sustainability and reinvention and the intersection of the two, the first word that, of course, comes out is sustainability. What do we mean by that? And for me, that word in the professional studies, in a professional setting, comes from the field of business and specifically organizational behavior, which studies organizations. An organization starts with two people. So whenever you're having a dinner conversation and you're debating with your friend what to have for dinner, you have an organization. 
But of course, the largest organization in terms of human systems is the humanity itself. And for me, this research studies and the interest I brought to this field was specifically this question. Why do some human systems survive and others die? Why do some human systems sustain and others disappear? That question for me was very personal. When I started the research in this field in 2001, it was very fresh because only 10 years ago, my country, Soviet Union, collapsed and disappeared. In August of 91, 10 years before I started my doctorate degree, three people came together in a secret location and decided to sign a paper that made my country disappear. And if you imagine you wake up one day and you have no government, no systems, no laws, no regulation of any kind, meaning there's no police, there's no education system. For my country, Kazakhstan, you, as you remember, Soviet Union was 15 independent republics that came together as a union. For my republic, Kazakhstan, it was such a shock such a surprise that it took us three years to introduce our own currency. We simply did not know how to run our monetary system. So for me, this was a very personal question because if I think about my childhood, I didn't see many atrocities in the Soviet Union, but my childhood, if you see that picture with a long line, that was my personal experience. Most of my childhood, what I remember is standing in lines. Already many years before the collapse, you could see that the system is collapsing. The food was so severely short that we would spend hours and hours every week hunting basic things like hot dogs and sour cream and butter. That was a big deal in our family, hot dogs and butter. And many years later, I took my daughter, she's 14 now, when she was about five, I took to her Venice. Venice, beautiful city, Europe. It's amazing, we spend the whole day walking through the city, and at the end of the day I ask her, what do you remember the most? And Lila says, but, and I'm like, what, what? <laughs> this is one of the most beautiful cities in the world, what do you mean, but? She said, well, the streets are very narrow, and I'm very short. <laughs> so you, most of what I saw the most days, is different people's butts. And the moment she said that, I was immediately transferred to my childhood that I completely forgot. Because if I think about the hours I spent standing in line for food, the most thing I remember is butts, because I was pretty short. This is what I talk about when I talk about sustainability in human systems. So it came natural that when I started my doctorate research and started consulting practice, one of the first companies that asked us to help them with their survival of their system was a company that was dealing with coffee. And if you remember 2001, 2002, the very famous coffee crisis, when the coffee industry killed almost the entire supply chain by lowering the prices below the means of survival for the farmers, when the farmers left and started living in the cities, the big Starbucks and Dunkin' Donuts of our world didn't recognize that until the next harvest, when it was already too late because it takes about five to six years for a coffee tree to produce coffee beans. So the first company for me that asked about survival was the company that was dealing at the intersection of environment and human survival. And after we helped them sustain their supply chain and recover it and reinvent it, they recommended us to a mining company and from there an energy company. And suddenly, a few years later, somebody introduces me as a sustainability professional. I'm like, what do I know about sustainability? So it was all complete accident. But what I do know about sustainability is that we are living in a remarkable time where for the first time ever, the things that used to be very scattered, the things that used to be done at different siloed professions and organizations are for the first time coming together. If you think about sustainability only 20 years ago, in business, it would be a non-starter conversation. Today, this is on the agenda of most boards. Granted, it's mainly boards. So to this day, if I come to a normal company, and I'm so happy that our speakers are not from the normal companies, but when I come to a normal company and start a sustainability conversation, and I invite people to the sustainability meeting, 
you see blood running away from people's faces. They have this horror in their eyes. Why me? Did I do something horrible? Did I fail in some way? Because only the managers who fail in their main profession go to this sustainability thing. I hope it's time to change that, and I hope we will be the people who will do that. Because this is the first time where the relationship between business, environment, and society is coming to a place of a real win-win. What do I mean by that? Well, if you look at, this is me drawing on my daughter's iPad, so I apologize. Uh, if you look at the very simplified version of what's happening in the economy right now, if you simplify it to the matter of seven-year-old, the simplest ways to explain our economy is that it's linear and it's throwaway, meaning that we mine, we process something, and we throw it away like the plastic spoons in the students, um, plastic forks in the students' videos, and we throw it away almost immediately. If you do an average calculation of how much ends up in a landfill for an average item, if you were to guess from all the things that are taken from the earth and then ends up in the minefield for a typical laptop, what would be your guess in the first 12 months? How much out of 100% of things that are mined and used for a laptop, how much, including the laptop itself, how much of it ends up in a landfill in the first 12 months? What would be your guess? Just give me a number. 70% in the landfill, you're an optimist. Somebody else, so we go higher. 95, you're still an optimist, let's go a little bit higher. 99, and still a little bit higher. For the average laptop today, it's between 97, but most laptops, 99.97%. If you think about it as an environmental disaster, if you talk to a business person about it, this is a business disaster because everything we get out of natural environment costs a lot of money, so we're literally throwing away a lot of money. And the thing that we notice from the, uh, from the dynamics of the linear economy is that it's coming to the end. It's very obvious that it's collapsing and coming to the end. On one side, on the right side, if you think about things we get out of Earth, this is mining, this is fishing, this is agriculture. That's pretty much the only three ways we grab stuff out of Earth. In terms of the numbers, the numbers cannot lie, but unfortunately for business, they don't see those numbers and they don't believe those numbers because for quite a lot of time, business has lived in a kind of macroeconomic miracle. If you remember what happens in macroeconomics, when the prices, oh, when the supply becomes very limited because there are a lot of demand for it. What should supposed to happen with the prices? The limited number of tomatoes, a lot of people want tomatoes. What should happen to the price? It's supposed to go up. But for the last 180 years, up until this century, we lived through a kind of macroeconomic miracle because we used more and more of natural re resources. The economic output went up, the population went up, but the prices on average adjusted for inflation went down. But that miracle is over. Already today, in the first 10, day, 10 years of the 21st century, the prices have begun to adjust and the raw materials in real terms have went up by 147%. But it's not only the prices, it's the content. So if you think about raw materials for our daily use, we're seeing severe declines, not only in volumes, the volumes is not an issue, it's the actual content. For all of you eat, I assume, right? All of you eat? Yeah? Anybody here who doesn't eat? Okay. So if you look at the actual chemical composition for most of our food, we've seen a severe decline. So this is just one of the studies um, from the University of Texas. I'm sure Ohio State has even better data with the School of Environment and Natural Resources. It would be exciting to see that data. But if you follow the crops, tomato, potatoes, peppers, across 20 years, the same kilo of tomatoes, the same kilo of potatoes, the same kilo of corn today gives much less nutrients. So on average, we lost 6% of protein, 16% of calcium, about 9% of phosphorus. Riboflavin, this is a nutrient without which a baby's brain cannot develop during pregnancy. On average, 38% of that is less in our food than was 20 years ago. So if you think about it, this is an environmental disaster, 
if you are a business person, this is a business strategy challenge. This is a real issue. If you are producing Campbell soup and you have a lot of beautiful tomatoes, but they have absolutely no nutritional value, you have a business problem on your hands. Same with species. I know there were some posters outside on biodiversity. We have been losing species on an extreme, extreme scale. So when I start talking to a business and start asking them basic questions, what happens to a business if we lose this group of species? The first conversation I ever had in that was about 10 years ago, and I had a group of bankers in front of me. And I asked them, they're all executives in the bank, I asked them, what happens to your bank, the whole group, you're in 27 countries, what happens to your bank if all bees die tomorrow? The first answer is nothing. I mean, we'll have no honey. That tells you how deeply they understand the systemic nature of biodiversity. And you give them 10 minutes to analyze it and go through the motion of understanding what happens to the pollination of food if there is no more bees, what will be happening to the price of food because we can pollinate otherwise. We already see in California where we see huge decline of bee population, a hand pollination, we have mini drones already developed, we have genetic modification happening. All of that is possible, but it makes your food incomparably more expensive. The moment they started looking at what will happen if bees disappear, their business will go bankrupt. That's what will happen, and relatively quick. So this is the exciting time where we can connect across the divides. It's no longer environment studied here, an environmentalist working here, and the sociologist and people caring about society working here, and the economist working here. For the first time, these connections are so much more on the surface because we're seeing a collapse. Then the question becomes, what is business to do? What, is, what are all these different things? So what? What is it that, that doing to the business itself? Well, so what? So far, unfortunately, in business, the situation is not super beautiful. The so what, there are about three categories of answers that business has offered so far, and I hope all of us will be able to introduce even more. So the answer number one that business has given to all of these new challenges is to look at sustainability as a trade-off. Either I make money, or I do something in the field of sustainability. So the moment I go in sustainability, things become more expensive. That's the number one response. And if you look at it, of course, you cannot do nothing. So companies start producing beautiful social responsibility reports that usually cost more money than the actual money invested in environment and society, and do other random things that we call greenwashing and window dressing because they truly do not believe in that. This is old data, so we did this study in 2011, that on average about 85% of businesses at that time were still in this category. Thankfully, it's moving, and the schools and graduates like yours are moving it forward. What is the second so what? It's what we call bolt-on sustainability, where you have a normal business, but you understand you've got to move somewhere, so you start one big project. You have normal yogurts, and then you produce one organic yogurt. You have normal cars, in quotation marks, and then you produce one green car. You have normal tomatoes, and then you produce one sustainable tomato. And of course, customers looking at that like, if this is a good yogurt, what's in the rest of the yogurts? So it's very unlikely that this strategy works, but it is a little bit of progress. And there's even more happening because some companies, some of the most amazing companies, and the three speaking today are definitely in this category, are looking at sustainability from embedded point of view, where the sustainability thinking, the environmental and social performance is built straight into the DNA, and it's integrated across all functions. It's integrated in R&D, it's integrated in production, it's integrated in HR, it becomes very holistic approach. So when we did all of this work in the field and we started looking at the sensation of progress, because this looks like progress, right? We've been in a horrible situation, then we got improved a little bit, then a little bit more. It all looks great. The problem is that the customers don't see it that way. Because if you ask a typical customer about what is the first thing that comes to mind that associates for you with the word sustainability, the first thing they see is, and the first thing they remember is that uh, this is something that is, generally speaking, not super attractive. Yeah? 
you pull endless number of customers and the, about the three attributes come back again. A typical sustainable product is generally ugly. So the normal apple is beautiful and the sustainable apple is kind of the sad looking thing on the side. The normal shoe is something designer and everyone wants and sustainable shoe is um, on your screen. The normal shoe can withstand on a normal car, can do high speed and do amazing stuff until Tesla came in. And the sustainable car is barely there, kind of falling apart, recycled materials. So the customers and the citizens of the um, society, the communities and the employees are beginning to get tired of this kind of green. They are asking for an alternative. And the good news that there is that alternative. But because, before I share a couple of examples and pass it on to our amazing speakers, just to confirm also one more problem we have with the word sustainability and why we need to associate it with something else. There's a bit of an issue with the word itself. So if you heard this joke from me already, I apologize. It just works. This joke really works. But imagine that today's Monday, right? So on Friday, you're done with the hard week's work. And at the end of the day, you go for dinner and you come out of a restaurant and you see an old neighbor of yours who moved to another part of town. So you haven't seen each other for a couple of years. You hug, you are excited, you used to have barbecues together and family gatherings. How's your life? How's your work? How's your marriage? Sustainable? No, just feel it. How's your marriage? Sustainable? Half of you are students, so you really don't get the joke. <laughs> How's your relationship? Sustainable? The word itself just misses this amazing uplift. You don't want your marriages to be just sustainable, I hope. You don't want your companies to be just sustainable, I hope. You don't want your communities to be just sustainable, I hope. I hope you want them to be amazing, exhilarating, exciting, extraordinary, flourishing, thriving. So we have a fundamental issue with the word itself. And here come companies who are saying, we need to bring new energy to this word. So what energy are we talking about? Well, these are the very quick companies that I will mention. The example such as Puma, when they decided that the bag can be reusable and bring more value, while at the same time severely reducing the water use, the plastic use, the paper use, and transportation cost and CO2 emissions. So it's not a negative, it's actually a positive. Throw and Grow Confetti, this is a company that produces party supplies. And instead of throwing away the confetti at the end of a party, you have seeds embedded in them. So you uh, collect the confetti, put it in your garden, and you have beautiful parsley and basil and everything else growing. Or Flow2, a startup in Europe that is an Airbnb for business. Every company in the world has unused capacity. All of it is waste. How about if this room is not used 100% of the time, we give it to somebody else. It's a community building, it's a reduced, a significant reduction of CO2 emissions and other pollution. It's a great thing for everyone. Or Drive Now or any other car sharing businesses. We have uh, Car2Go here, I think, uh, and other car sharing businesses. Again, same idea. Most of our cars are never used 100% of the time. They actually use very little. For the waste they've generated through the value chain, they're used very little. Can we do car sharing? And other companies, such as Recapture, this is a very, uh, very surprising way to reuse, reduce, and recycle. So I'm sure many of you use Capture, right? When you're filling out a form and the computer asks you to fill out the squiggly words to prove that you are not a robot. Now, if you calculate how much time all of us spend that, on that, how much energy is wasted because we are all sitting on the computers in a lit room most of the time, filling this up and calculate globally how much energy is wasted. It's clear that's tons of energy. So here's an innovation. Recapture is a company that said, how do we recycle that energy? They introduced the concept where you no longer fill out one word, but two. One of them is a randomly generated word. The other one is a picture from a book that needs digitizing. So all of us have been digitizing books for free. Maybe you feel a bit abused right now for Google Books. But it's an ingenious way to recycle and reinvent the concept of recycling, even in IT sphere. Same with uh, Mud Jeans. This is a company in Holland, in Amsterdam, that doesn't just sell jeans. It also leases jeans. 
Now, many of you are like, what? I don't want somebody else's jeans, you know. You don't know what was there, right? <laughs> well, you will never get somebody else's jeans. The whole idea of my jeans is circular economy, is the idea of how do we collect jeans before they get to the landfill. In the most of recycling problems, the difficulty is the collection. Just like in distribution, it's a very complex process. Collection is a very complex process. For example, a typical ton of uh, cell phones has 18 to 30 times more gold than a typical ton of gold ore. We should be mining cell phones. The problem is to collect them in that volume that we need. So my jeans is the story of recycling and creating an easy way for customers to return it. So is it sustainability and reinvention? Sustainability through reinvention? Or maybe sustainability fundamentally is all about reinvention. We tend to think about sustainability as something that holds us in the past. The exciting time we live in now is sustainability that's something that brings us to the future because it allows us, just like nature reinvents every season, to reinvent again and again and again and do it with much more grace. With that, I want to introduce the three amazing speakers that will bring their stories and this idea to life. We have with us Patagonia and Janice and Owens Corning. And I'm very happy that our first speaker from Patagonia is also a Ohio State alum. Uh, Katie graduated from Ohio Fisher School of Business in 2005. Katie Fornado now is uh, in supply chain analytics, um, analyzing and working on supply chain for Patagonia. And while she was here at Ohio State, she was also very active in net impact. And I know many of you are net impactors. Can I see the hands? If you are not yet in net impact and you are a student here, get engaged with this amazing organization. With that, I pass it on to Katie. The floor is yours. Hey guys, uh, I'm Katie Fernando. Uh, excuse me that I'm getting over a cold. I have some water. Hope I'm not coughing too much. Um, I am, as Nadia said, a 2015 grad um, of the Fisher College of Business. Um, and I, uh, my undergrad was at UMBC, University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Um, has anyone heard of UMBC? Maybe you watched March Madness? Yes, so it was a very exciting time for me because finally people outside of Maryland have heard of UMBC. So UMBC is the first 16 seed um, to ever beat a one seed. We beat UVA. Um, it was very exciting. So I'm um, a UMBC grad. I went to uh, Fisher College of Business. I graduated in 2015. And now I find myself um, in Ventura, California, um, working with Patagonia. I'm a supply planning analyst. Um, I more or less sit between um, the supply planning, or the, uh, the forecasting teams and the production teams. Um, forecast tells me what they want, I tell production what they need to make, and they attempt to make it happen. So um, Patagonia was founded by Yvon Schwinnard um, in 1974. Um, Patagonia was not originally an apparel company. Um, Yvon Schwinnard is affectionately known as a dirt bag. Um, he was a mountain climber. Uh, he would spend a couple months a year climbing mountains in Yosemite. He would spend a few years after that, or a few months after that, uh, surfing. And then in his free time, he, he bought an anvil, um, and he would forge pitons. Pitons are pieces of metal that you, uh, of iron, that you hammer into a rock um, so you can climb it. Uh, at the time, pitons um, were permanent. You hammer them into the rock, step on it, you use it, you move up. Hammer another one in, step on it, you use it, you move up. As, as climbing caught on, uh, more and more people um, started leaving their pitons in these rocks, and it was damaging them. So Yvonne Schwinnard built this, um, this business selling pitons through a catalog. And as he noticed all these pitons in these rocks, he said, we can't do this anymore. This is not sustainable. So he, um, he created a new kind of piton, and he called it a chalk. And it was made of aluminum. And these aluminum chalks were removable. So they weren't being left in these rocks. They weren't causing the damage that the iron uh, pitons were. And he decided to introduce them in his catalog um, with a 14-page essay on why it was important to, to, to be a good steward of the environment, of our natural spaces, and why um, we should be, um, <laughs> why, we, why we should be um, caring so much about this, and why we should be using these aluminum chalks. So with a 14-page essay, within one year, all demand um, from his company um, shifted from uh, these iron pitons to aluminum chalks. 
And so with a 14-page essay, he moved the entire marketplace um, by convincing them. And so some of you may be familiar with the Patagonia catalog. Um, it's been part of the, the brand since the very beginning um, when we were making climbing equipment. And this is the way Patagonia tells stories. It's the way we convince people of things. It's the way we tell them what we're doing. And it's the way we tell them what we, we care about and what we hope you care about. So that was kind of the birth of the Patagonia catalog as a storytelling instrument. Um, and so uh, one of the first, um, so after uh, Yvonne was uh, producing these, uh, these instruments, he decided to start importing clothing. So in 1974, um, he started importing rugby clothes uh, from Adidas. Um, and Umbro abroad. They became really popular with uh, his, his climbing buddies. Um, and so he started making his own. So in 1974, Patagonia was born. Thank you. Patagonia was born. Um, and the mission statement at Patagonia is to build the best product, um, to do no unnecessary harm, and to use business to inspire and implement solutions to the environmental crisis. Um, and that's, again, where our, our um, catalog comes in. And so uh, tonight I wanted to tell you about a couple of stories, um, kind of what it looks like on the ground um, working in sustain a sustainable business. Um, sustainability is one of the three prongs of our mission statement. It's a core part of what we do, and it's always a consideration when we're making decisions. So um, when we went into organic cotton, it was 1994, Yvonne learned that 10% um, of the world's pesticides were used on cotton. And he said, that's not something I want to be a part of anymore. And so within two years, I need this company to be completely organic cotton. It seemed impossible. Uh, the global supply chain of organic cotton was tiny. And so we immediately started partnering with farms, helping to get them organic certified, um, helping them to understand why it was important. And we had three goals with this. We wanted to sell the new cotton product, um, we wanted to convince people that this was a good idea and something that we wanted, and we wanted to inspire other businesses to be using this. So 25 years later, we've done an evaluation, and we think we've succeeded on the first two, but probably not on the third one. So coming soon, you're going to see some more um, focus from Patagonia on organic cotton. Um, global supply of organic cotton compared to uh, conventional cotton is about 1%. And it's been the same uh, ever since we've got into organic cotton 25 years ago. So we're hoping that we can inspire other uh, companies to get into to organic cotton next. And uh, every time we get into a new program, we have some goals like this. Um, so we did a company-wide audit a couple years ago um, to understand the impact of uh, the materials we were using, transportation we were using, et cetera. Um, organic cotton was the number, or cotton, conventional cotton was the number one um, polluting um, product that we were using. So we, we tackled that first. Next we decided to get into some recycled uh, fibers. So nylon, polyester, these are all made of petroleum. So if we can get into um, recycled materials, we're going to be saving a lot of petroleum. So we partnered with our mills. We had to go way back into our tier two, tier three suppliers, um, and we developed some, uh, some, some recycled uh, nylon, polyester, etc. And so from this one step, we took more and more and more. And so once we were producing recycled garments, we wondered how can our customers continue this? So we decided to make a way for people to recycle their, their garments. So we opened a repair facility in Reno, Nevada, where we have our main warehouse. And in Reno, we accept uh, garments for repair. If they're irreparable, um, we will hold on to them and maybe use them for their parts, for their zippers, um, for their buttons, etc. And um, our customers can send them in. If something is past its useful life, um, we'll send them a gift card and they can get something new that they like. And so we've created a closed supply chain um, with our worn wear program. And so when we receive garments back, um, we can either repair them and return them, we can use them for their parts uh, and recycle them. Um, or if they're in really good condition and the person doesn't want them back, we can sell them through our Warnware program, warnware.com. Um, and so we've made this revenue neutral, and it's a, now it's like a closed loop supply chain. Um, and so this is a way that our customers can get involved as well with the recycling process. So a couple years ago, um, we, many years ago, we got into wool. Uh, wool is a key um, component of base layers um, for outdoor activities. And we partnered with a group called Ovis 21. 
Um, it's a collective of farms in Argentina and Chile, and um, they were producing wool for us. We like them because they use regenerative practices with their land, um, as well as their animal husbandry processes. So in 2015, uh, PETA put out a video showing there were some things happening in the supply chain that we didn't know about and we weren't proud of. Um, within a week, we had pulled out of that supply chain completely. We had, we had gone back to them. They were not interested in changing or improving, and we were not interested in being a part of a supply chain that wasn't ethical in our opinion. So we partnered with the Textile Exchange. Textile Exchange um, is a nonprofit that works with the global textile industry. Uh, it's a $1.7 trillion industry, and they work to mitigate and reduce and even reverse um, the negative impacts of uh, on uh, social and environmental environmental impacts um, on the planet um, in the textile supply chain. So they developed a responsible wool sourcing um, list checklist, and so we took that and we worked with them and we added to it. We said we want all of this, but we want some more. We think we can do better. And so once we had put together this really long list, it turned out we spent one year looking the, uh, all across the world to find suppliers who met uh, every criteria. We didn't find any. No one met all of our criteria. And so we had to decide, are we going to be a company that is in wool? Are we going to be a company that's in wool in a way we don't want to be? So we decided, what are the issues that are zero tolerance and which are the issues that are critical? Is there anyone who has a few critical issues but no zero tolerance? And we found two farms, uh, and we partnered with them, and we co-invested. And so we are moving the wool supply chain uh, forward um, by investing with them and making things better. And so had we decided to hang back and not get involved at all, um, the, wool, the global wool supply chain would have hung back kind of at a lower quality standard. And because we got involved and because we've co-invested, um, we think that we're moving wool forward globally. And so finally, I just wanted to kind of use these examples to explain to you um, kind of the different ways we make decisions at Patagonia. Um, it's not always linear, it's not always pretty, it's not always about making a perfect decision, uh, but it's about making the best decision you can. It can be about building on little decisions until you have a closed loop supply chain like we have um, with our recycled uh, petroleum products. So um, it, it doesn't also have to be about um, the products you make. Um, one step towards sustainability we made at our headquarters that's in retrospect is kind of a no-brainer is um, we took away trash cans from employees' desks. We were using 500 trash can liners a day at desks, uh, and they were nearly empty every day, but they, they took them out every night and um, put them in the garbage. So we're saving 500 trash can liners a day just by not having uh, trash cans at people's desks. Um, so it's these kinds of little decisions that can make a big impact. It doesn't have to be about the product you're selling. It can be about the way you're doing business. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much, Casey. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I hope this also becomes a much more honest conversation. So when we were discussing and preparing for this event and having our Skype meetings, it was all about making sure that this is very honest. It's not very easy to get sustainability right. You make a step forward, you realize it's not working, you have to make a lot of steps back. So the stories you see today are not perfect stories by design. We wanted to share how messy this is. The second story teller of today comes from a big manufacturing company, a leader in insulation, roofing, um, and construction materials, a very difficult industry. And Frank O'Brien Bernini is Vice President and Chief Sustainability Officer at Owen Corning. The interesting thing about Frank is that he started his uh, education in one of the first sustainability programs of our days. And at that time, it was not even called sustainability, it was called resourceful weaving. He also did his graduate in solar uh, technology, and that research led him to the Owen Corning, and there he went all the way up to head of R&D. And that perspective, product perspective, I think is very powerful, and science perspective. So with that, Frank, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Nadia. All right, this is awesome. I get to be sandwiched between very cool clothing and apparel and delicious ice cream. So um, I'm gonna to talk to you about roofing, insulation, and composites. All right, good. All right, I love that. 
So that's what we're going to talk about. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about our company first to ground you if you've not heard of Owens Corning. Um, like your organization, it's been around 50 years. Ours has been around just about 80 years. Started in 1938. Uh, very interesting story on how the company started through prohibition, trying to figure out what to do with all these glass assets that didn't need to be used to make bottles anymore to carry spirits. So that was kind of the genesis of, of our company. Uh, we've been on the Fortune 500 for 63 years. That's as long as there has been a Fortune 500. Um, so, our, uh, <clears throat> and the, uh, um, the, the company has evolved to three strong businesses. And, and as I mentioned, our insulation business, you may know us as the Pink Panther, so pink insulation. Um, it's a global business. Our roofing business is primarily a North American business. That's our, our second large business. The third business is our composites. And uh, you probably know roofing because you can see it out here on all these buildings. And you know insulation, everybody's seen the pink insulation. Uh, the composites business is an interesting business that not many people know about. However, composites are everywhere. They're in the chairs likely that you're sitting in. They're in our ceilings, they're all over. Uh, they're typically reinforcements that go into plastics that uh, create a more sustainable life. If you look at all the wind turbine blades that are around the world, that's our composites business building those uh, reinforcements to go into wind turbine blades, vehicle light weighting. So, so those are the three, three businesses that we're in. Um, uh, about six and a half billion dollars in sales um, globally, 19,000 employees operating about 130 plants across 37 countries. So that's kind of the land, like, landscape of, of Owens Corning. Um, we operate what we talk about as a sustainable enterprise. You see the five kind of pillars of our sustainable enterprise. Uh, financial strength, which every company that's a for-profit company would talk about the importance of financial strength um, because we do have to generate returns for our investors. And that's the really exciting thing about the concept of corporate sustainability is finding economic avenues to doing the social and environmental good that you want to bring into the world. And I'm gonna give some examples of that. Um, high performance people, which is really our, our development, our talent development. Uh, we do a lot of work to bring on and develop talent throughout careers in our company. The third area is customer inspired. We're always looking for what are our customers needing in this space, and I'll give a few examples of that. Um, and then uh, operational performance. Uh, it, it's very important to operate a company like ours very uh, um, well throughout from, from raw materials all the way to finished products. So operational excellence is a very important part. And finally, the world-class sustainability, which is really gonna be kind of the topic that I'm talking about. But I wanted to use this slide. Uh, we use it with our investors. We put it in our SEC reports. Uh, it is the way we think about operating a company uh, for the future and, and our current. So I'll talk a little bit about sustainability. Nadia talked about um, almost with disdain the word sustainability. Uh, but I will tell you that, that it's a word that I have a love-hate relationship with uh, because sometimes I think about it the way that Nadia does, that it's not very inspirational or, or like doesn't have an aspiring. Um, however, what's cool about sustainability, the word, is that so few people really understand what it means that uh, you get to make it up. You get to describe exactly for your company what you mean by sustainability. And so we use this phrase that, that was up there, that, uh, that sustainability, and we took this from the UN very early in the, the conversation in the world of sustainability in the early 80s, uh, meeting the needs of the present without compromising the world that we leave to the future. And what for me is exciting about that is that, that if you're ever having a conversation with someone that uh, maybe doesn't know if they really get this thing about sustainability, if you go all the way up to this, meeting the needs of the present without uh, compromising the, the, meeting the needs of the present without compromising uh, the future that we leave for future generations, uh, I like to think about it sort of in reverse, and is that a kind of company you would want to work for, a company that is meeting today, today's needs but is okay with compromising the needs of the future. Uh, not many people want to work for a company like that. Uh, and so that kind of brings you to a grounding of what is this all about. Uh, 
so, so that's kind of how we think about sustainability. Why I get inspired by the idea is that we further say that in creating that company for the future, we actually want to do more than sustain or keep things kind of the way they are uh, or not do worse. Um, we we want to create a positive impact on the world, a net positive impact where what we talk about is our handprint or the positive impact that we have on the world far outstrips the negative impact or our footprint. So our positive impact is very much larger than our negative impact. And you may think that that sounds tagline-y like, in fact, we talk about the purpose of our company being that our people and products make the world a better place. And that for sure sounds like a tagline. But I will tell you, it's not a tagline, it's a math problem. And it's a math problem grounded in the science of life cycle assessment, the kind of environmental analytics of products from the cradle to the grave or uh, cradle back to the cradle. Uh, it's the analytics to figure out are the products that you're making, the solutions you're bringing into the world, are they in fact better for the world? So if you say your people and products make the world a better place, you need to do the math, the handprint minus the footprint, and is that getting bigger and bigger and bigger every day? And so I'll give you an example of how that works that it'll be pretty easy to understand. If you take a uh, typical house in Chicago, uh, it's kind of cool out right now, so you can think about insulating a house in Chicago. You take that typical house and you look at the energy that it takes, so we're going to have like a little greenhouse gas uh, LCA or life cycle assessment here. Uh, you take all the energy that it takes to insulate that 2,400 square foot house in Chicago. You could take that energy, you could put it into a car, you could drive that car across the United States. So 3,000 miles across the United States, that's how much energy it takes to insulate to current codes a uh, standard 2,400 square foot house in Chicago. Now you'd say, why do you do that? You know, why would you take all that energy? Uh, well, it's because of the handprint or the positive impact that that insulation makes on the world when you insulate that house. So how much energy is saved? So what is the positive aspect of that? So you know, 3,000 miles, that's a lot of energy across the United States. How much energy is saved through the life of that house? And what you find if you do that assessment is that you could take that same car and you could drive that car to the moon and back, not, not just once, not just twice, but five times on the energy saved through the insulation that you put in that house. So there's your handprint, the positive impact you have, minus your footprint. And so you say, well, there are a few things that I could do to make that even better. I can further reduce my footprint, maybe have the uh, amount of energy be the same as driving halfway across the country. I could use a bunch of renewable energy, um, which we have. And so we can shrink that footprint even more and we can grow the handprint by collaborating with our customers to help them build even more efficient houses. So when you use that insulation, you could drive back and forth to the moon 10 times. Um, so that's the math of saying what sounds like a tagline, our people and products make the world a better place, to actually using the science and the analytics of life cycle assessments. So, um, so we make this come to life across four sustainability pillars. You can see sort of the social pillars, safety, health, community activities that, that we do in all the communities that, that we operate around the world. Operations, that's the footprint reduction part that I just talked about. The next two are really on the handprint side product and supply chain sustainability, trying to get more and more sustainable with our product offerings, and then working up and down the supply chain through innovation and collaboration to help our customers, and often our customers' customers, they might be automotive OEMs, uh, to make their vehicles better through the use of our products. Um, so as we're driving our footprint down, uh, one of the big aspects that we've done over the last couple of years is begun sourcing a lot of renewable energy. Now we are uh, sourcing over 60% of the electricity that we use in the United States is sourced from renewable sources. Uh, we became the largest uh, industrial uh, purchaser of renewable energy a couple years ago when we did a couple big wind deals where we had 
two large wind farms built for us. And so this is about, you know, the driving the car across the United States, 3,000 miles, trying to like, can we reduce the amount of energy, uh, or not, not just the energy itself through energy efficiency, but can we source more sustainable energy to be able to make those products? And so we've done a lot of work on that. And as we've driven our footprint down, uh, we look, that's really about our manufacturing, and then we've done a lot of work on the supply chain, so the transportation of raw materials to our operations and from our operations, and kind of what's interesting is that, that we've kind of found on our way using, again, the, the life cycle analysis, is that we've done a terrific job on reducing the impact of the areas that I've got circled there. Uh, the impact of trucks coming into our operations, on our actual manufacturing, sourcing renewable energy, that sort of thing, on the trucks leaving, putting more materials on trucks, being more efficient in the way they're packed, uh, and kind of driving down that side of it, boosting our handprint through the use phase, better wind turbines through the use of our products, uh, more uh, efficient homes and commercial buildings, more durable roofs, more durable infrastructure through our products. So done a lot of great work there. But what we found out along the way is what was fairly immaterial in the beginning, the impacts of, uh, sorry, throw the slide back here, the impact of sourcing of raw materials, and then at the end of life, now as we've driven down the other part has become a more and more material part of our overall uh, life cycle assessment. So as we've done this work and we've been at it for about a decade and a half now, one thing that, that I've certainly found, and I, I love this uh, Bill Gates quote, that you know, as we set goals, we almost always overestimate what we can get done in a year and underestimate what we can get done in a decade. And I want to give you an example of that. Uh, here is the use of recycled glass into our insulation products. You can see four decades of progress trying to increase the amount of recycled content in our fiberglass insulation uh, to now where three quarters or so of the raw materials are coming from glass. And so does anybody in this room drink beer? All right. So consume responsibly and recycle. Because for every six bottles of beer, um, you can create one bat of insulation, which is about 15 inches wide, about eight feet tall, and about three and a half inches thick. And it ends up in our factory. We have one right here in Newark, Ohio. So if you're gonna drink beer or drink wine, uh, anything from a bottle, drink responsibly and most responsibly recycle because it'll end up in insulation that'll last a couple hundred years in a building. So what I want to highlight in this chart is you see the progress, the most progress that was made was the decade between 2002 and 2012. And that's when we set our first sustainability goals. And we set a goal to dramatically increase over double the amount of recycled glass that we use in our operations because it reduced energy, it increased the sustainable attributes of our products. And we made a tremendous amount of progress from setting hard goals over a decade. And I will leave you with asking, you know, for yourself, um, especially the young folks that are just starting on your careers, uh, you know, what is the distinct contribution that you're going to have in this decade? So with that, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Frank. So as you can see, the industries are very different, but the stories all have the same kind of struggle and same kind of realness in them. Uh, I love the idea of handprint and footprint, constantly thinking we cannot be at zero. At this point, if we are very true and very honest, we understand that the way we develop the economy and society at this point, it's very hard to be at zero immediately. So how do we allow ourselves a time to reinvent our processes and products and solutions so we bring the footprint down while bringing our handprint up and having enough compassion for each other as we do that because it's very, very difficult. If you think of a big, massive corporation, existing business, trying to reinvent itself from a normal, normal business to a sustainable business, it's as complex as having a functioning turned on vacuum cleaner that is vacuuming plugged in on and 
slowly transforming it into functioning plugged-in TV set without unplugging it. That is as complex of a job this is. It's generally speaking, many, many different new knowledge and skills that need to come about. And this is the exciting part that I, um, I have about Jenny's story because it's also very honest about small and big steps that all can take when we are reinventing our businesses or our lives. And I'm very, very happy to introduce our final speaker, Sarah Moore, also Bakai alum. Uh, she graduated from her bachelor degree here and then went on to get an MBA in sustainability. Uh, Sarah joined uh, Jenny's Ice Cream to work not only on sustainability but also on the retail operation because the exciting news that our little local startup, Jenny's Ice Cream, is growing global and now I just learned this coast to coast. So with that, Sarah, it's all yours. Everybody. I have to say, uh, first off, thank you to Nadia and thank you all for having me here tonight. I graduated from Ohio State School of Environment and Natural Resources in 2015. And when I was a student and for the couple years after, I had the chance to see a lot of great environmental uh, panelists and uh, presentations. So it's really cool to be up here and thank you for having me tonight. Uh, I'd like to start by taking you back to back to 2002. Now, for some of you, this may feel like it was uh, yesterday. I know for me, any year after 2000 feels like it was, uh, it, it, it was just a day or two ago. Like, any year after 2000 feels like it was just, a, a, uh, just yesterday. Um, think about your lives in 2002. What was going on? Uh, George Bush was president in 2002. The iPhone hadn't been developed yet. It was the first year that the iPod was on the market. Um, everyone was walking around with those Nokia brick phones. Uh, I had a red one and thought that was pretty cool until the flip phone came out. Uh, so think about your own lives in 2002. In Columbus in 2002, let's see here. In Columbus in 2002, a lady by the name of Jenny Britton Bauer was opening her second attempt at a ice cream scoop shop in Columbus's own North Market just down the road. And I say that this is her second attempt because her first attempt didn't go as planned. So she had a couple more years of experience under her belt and was coming back this time to make the best ice creams that not only she could imagine, but to prove to others that she could make the best ice cream in the country. Um, to, to make the best ice cream in the country and to make this new artisanal ice cream that the industry had never seen before. She wanted to start with the highest quality ingredients. She, she wanted to start with this produce that was so fresh and with uh, spices that were so fragrant and aromatic. And she could get those ingredients from the surrounding stalls and her neighbors right there at North Market. So not only was she creating the highest quality ice cream that she could imagine by, uh, by purchasing from the other vendors there in the market, but she was also supporting the local community and supporting those in the local food system. Um, so, so, 16 years later, our country has, or our company has grown to have 34 scoop shops from coast to coast acro across the country. Uh, we're also in over 3,000 grocery store shelves, and we shipped over 70,000 boxes of ice cream to customers' homes last year. But throughout all of this change, we have never lost sight of uh, how we started purchasing and how Jenny started the company. She, uh, we're still purchasing from the, the growers and the makers and producers that, uh, that Jenny started by purchasing from. Uh, today, we call this the fellowship model. We're building ice creams from the ground up. One of our favorite examples of this is Mike Hirsch. Uh, from Hirsch Fruit Farms, which is just about an hour south of our uh, kitchen here in Columbus. And Mike Hirsch, on, on Saturday mornings, Jenny would go to the market and she would go outside and she would find the freshest berries that she could that Mike was selling. And she would buy first a pint and then a flat of these berries uh, to make her ice creams for the week and to make the freshest ice cream that she could. Well now, 16 years later, we're still working with Mike but instead of purchasing just a, a pint or a, a flat of his berries, we're purchasing entire fields of his berries. Now, this is, 
this is great for us because we're still working with uh, a producer that knows the quality standards that we have. But it's also great for Mike because now he knows that he'll be able to sell a certain amount of berries every year because we, we promise and we guarantee him that we will buy uh, a, a large quantity of his strawberries and his blackberries and his pumpkins every year. This, uh, this means that Mike doesn't have to go from farmer's market to farmer's market to try to sell each little pint of his berries. He has a reliable buyer. So uh, since 2002, a lot of people have joined the artisanal ice cream movement. Jenny was one of the first, and she came up with these flavors that were uh, salty caramel. They were inventive, goat cheese with red cherries, flavors that the ice cream industry had never seen before. But since 2002, a lot of artisanal ice cream makers have have joined, joined the industry and have followed Jenny's leadership. So we have to continually reinvent our business and our practices, uh, still keeping that core DNA of uh, the fellowship model in our company, but also reinventing our processes so that we stay a leader in the industry and we keep on top of those trends. Um, everyone at Jenny's has a favorite example of how they continually reinvent their processes and their practices, and mine that I'm going to share with you tonight has to do with um, this tiny little spoon. Now, I don't know if you guys can see it, maybe just a few, first couple people here in the first rows, um, but this spoon has had a big impact on our business. Now, for any ice cream enthusiasts out there, uh, you might know that when you go into a Jenny's shop, you are welcomed with open arms and you are encouraged to try Every, every flavor you want, as many times as you want. Um, that's our way of opening our arms to the community and welcoming you into our shops. And we, it's like a golden rule at Jenny's, come in and sample as many times as you, as you want. Um, and that means that a lot of these little plastic taster spoons are going into the landfill every year. Uh, if you think of one customer might try 20 flavors in their visit, and so 20 of these spoons are going into the landfill. So a couple years ago, we made a change to go to a reusable metal taster spoon. Now this seems like a tiny change, but environmentally it saves over a million and a half of those plastic taster spoons, those single use spoons, from going into our landfill. These can be reused, we, we haven't seen a limit yet, as, as many times as possible. Um, not only are these not not only are the spoons not going into the landfill, but we're not having to send those single-use spoons from our sourcing here in Columbus to shops all across the country. Um, once shops have these, they can reuse them a million times, and they don't have to they don't have to factor in those greenhouse gas emissions from transporting a spoon from Columbus to shops all across the country. Um, so environmentally, it was a huge payoff. Financially, we, uh, these spoons are actually specialty salt taster spoons. And so they are expensive to buy up front, but that quickly pays off over the life of reusing these spoons. Not only that, but it makes for a better customer experience. It's like eating off a metal spoon when you're eating ice cream at home, which is pretty cool. And somehow it's even better because this spoon is tiny, which everyone finds to be much cuter. <laughs> um, it also makes our employees' lives a lot easier. They're happy because they don't have to spend the time to go through the sourcing list and to uh, order more of those little taster spoons. And then they're shipped to their shops, and then they have to find some place to store all of these boxes of single-use spoons. Now they just have these, and they're in their shops, and they can reuse them as many times as possible. Um, this is my favorite example because it is a small action, it's a small change on our sourcing list that has had a huge impact. Over a million and a half of these, uh, the single-use spoons are no longer going into the landfill. Um, so I encourage you all this evening to, to look at ways in your own life to think about that low-hanging fruit that could have a big impact environmentally or financially. Uh, it could be a small change with a huge payoff, and I think the spoon is a great example of that. Thank you. Sarah, don't leave yet. Sarah, come back to me. This is the time for question and answer, so I actually will invite both 
Frank and Katie also to join Sarah. But before we do question and answers in terms of you asking questions of us, we actually want to ask you questions. I think the most interesting stories, there's such a rich presence in this room. These are professionals, these are students, these are professors, this is emeritus professors. So just grab a seat. Yeah, this is a perfect time to ask you questions. So the first order of the day, find somebody near you you don't know. A few of you came with other people. I could see that, that you came with other people. So don't talk to them. Find somebody you don't know. And it's uncomfortable, so do it anyway. Yeah, you found somebody you don't know? At least you don't know very well. I see some people cheating, like my family is cheating right there. Good. Introduce yourself. Good. I see the introductions happening. And our panel barely knows each other, so it applies to them too. Barely. Okay, so here are your questions. You are to interview your partner, or if you are with few people, to interview all of the people you're talking to. So this is your interview questions. Ask your partner or partners, number one, what are their favorite stories of driving the sustainability through reinvention. Maybe it's a small story or a big story. This is the perfect time to ask your partner, what is their favorite story? You heard some stories today, but I'm sure you have at least one that you think is like a little golden gem that can be shared with the community. And the second question is also share with your partner, what do you think is one little thing you can do in your own life? Whether you are a student, you are a professor, you are a retiree, you are a professional in from environmental professional network, this is a perfect time to think of one more thing. I know you all do a lot because you are here, so you are already interested in this topic. But think of one more thing that you can do to bring more sustainability into your life. One little thing you can reinvent. So let's... You see how the sound is trying to highlight the importance of this question? So take one, uh, about two, three minutes and share these two simple things. One good story, one thing you can reinvent. Go both ways in about three, four, or five minutes, depending on how it goes, I'll stop you. We can yeah. Thank you for taking the time doing this. I know it's very, it's I do it for, so it's not, it's not like I know what I'm doing. I was very young. My, my sister had a, um, a flat foot. It's, it's quite serious disease. And we were forced to dance. She was six and I was three. She said she's not dancing on her own. And I started dancing when I was three. And I was on stage since about age five. So you, after a while, you know, when you're a child, you don't know. But I still get so nervous, I'm sweating like a little piglet, I'm scared, so it's not, it never goes away. You just kind of give yourself little tricks of how to help yourself down and down. Yeah. Do you like living in Cape Town? My experience, I was just there a couple of weeks ago. I felt like people have more sustainability in their life. I don't know how. First of all, they move more. It, it's a huge thing about consumption. You can see there's this commitment to energy and movement, physical movement, corporate movement. Yeah, you can really see it, but I don't know how to use it. I wonder how to bring it to a more mid Midwest in the mid Oh, that's hard. Here, yeah. it's such an easy yeah. win. Hi, Joe. Twitter. Twitter. Yes. I don't do that. Yes. Grab a knife, and I'll say, Joe, what questions are you seeing on Twitter? And you will read them out. And then they will go to the office. In like three oh. minutes. Yes. What is you, your pick? What's the best question you should we should ask our audience? Pick a best question from the for the from the audience to our panel. I don't know. 
I think they should. We were when we were designing this event because I asked what happened before. They said, "Well, one speaker and then Q and A, and then it's done." And I'm like, I think we need more than one speaker because we are all so used to the TED style that either we catch up or we're perpetually sliding down. And I think this is such a nice combination of us all. Yeah. And second, I said, let's let's make people talk. They know this stuff. Yeah. So. How was your experience with Fisher? It was wonderful. Um, not as sustainability I I got that. I met the school because I'm friends with Chris Kuhn. Maybe she was the dean for that point. Yeah, she's amazing. She's amazing. One of the most, I don't know, honest and the way she got simple, that is not easy. Simple is so hard. Her way of thinking is so clean and nice. Yeah. And she introduced me to the dean and other people, and I could see immediately they're like, we don't do sustainability. It was very sweet, but very honest. Just a reminder to use the Twitter hashtag. It feels good, yeah, I can imagine. My husband dreamt of getting into Fisher and he didn't, so he went to Case Western and we met there um, at the Halloween party in the first year. So he's like, okay, I forgive Fisher, I forgive them. Okay, so come back to me. Come back to me. I'm sure there are some good stories. So there are mics in the room. There are people with the mics. This is a good time to start sharing the stories. This is also a great time where you can post your questions for the panelists for this uh, amazing combination of stories uh, to the Twitter and we will also have a tweet up. But I'm sure there are some good stories. So anybody wants to start us off? If you just put a hand up and there should be a mi microphone magically appearing next to you. And if you don't volunteer, I'll start volunteering you. So I'm sure there is something that you heard that was interesting or unexpected. Yes, there is, Joe, there's a first hand up right here. You know, it's nerve wracking. It's like 800 people registered for this event and you need to speak in front of everyone. Introduce yourself and what did you hear? Uh, hello, everybody. My name is John and I was talking to my friend John here. Um, <laughs> and uh, something that he talked about that uh, a, a way that sustainability has been reinvented is that uh, the nation has been moving. Uh, you know, in the 20th century, we're moving towards suburbanization, and recently we've been moving towards urban environments, which mm -hmm. has reduced like the total net impact uh, that we have had on the environments, and reducing like transportation costs, you know, cost of living, things like that. Yeah. Absolutely. Do we already have uh, good uh, good grocery stores in downtown Columbus? Not yet. No. That's the first sign that the city is becoming livable. And I spent a long time in Cleveland, so when Cleveland got its first grocery store, we were like, this is it, this is monumental. So maybe we all can push downtown Columbus to get the first grocery store, then we all will have a more urban environment. Absolutely, thank you so much. Thank Give you. them a hand. <laughs> Somebody else. I'm sure there's another comment or question or story. Oh, there's a hand right here. You just go around and pass it on. And in the meantime, if you have questions for the panelists, tweet them with the hashtag that is on the screen Thanks. in a second. Um, my name is Diane Cadnega, and my partner, Stephen Lovejoy, and I, uh, we just started a, uh, just growing our own food in our backyard. So we turned the sunny part of the lawn into a food garden. And then we realized that, um, in our neighborhood, there's a lot of low income and food insecurity issues and food deserts. And so it didn't seem like very much more to grow our own food, but also just produce more seedlings, vegetable seedlings grown organically. So um, we grew 1,400 of them in the basement last year wow. and then had a sale for that so that we could donate the 700 um, plants to community gardens in the neighborhood. But with that, um, 
my grandmother showed me how to make these paper origami pots. So we reused the newspaper advertising that came to our mailbox and folded these paper pots. So at the sale, people just transferred the plants into the paper pots. We could save and recycle the plastic pots, which was our big ex expense, so we could keep our costs low once we washed and used them the next year. And so we've been adopted by a couple 4-H clubs, and this year they folded another 850. So it seems like a small thing, but the newspaper gets recycled in the yard. The cardboard, everything gets lasagna mulch. We reuse our leaves for our own fertilizer. And so it became more, um, we had some issues with our neighbors because of the more natural <laughs> landscape. But then we added the pollinating attracting plants and companion plants. And so it's now a certified wildlife habitat and monarch way station. Um, and hopefully we'll have bees this year as well. So what a story. It's, uh, <laughs> it started off just by eating healthier food for myself. Don't give, away, don't give away the microphone yet. Are you planning to grow the seedlings this year? Uh, there's about 1,500 of them jammed up in the Are basement. Are you planning to sell them again for the charity donation? Yes. It's How on, do people find you? Uh, it's Sunny Glen Garden on Facebook, and the sale is on May 6th from 2 to 4, um, and you'll be helped supporting getting um, more of the organic foods to our neighborhood. Please leave your contact. Let's see who can put their hand up. Somebody from a volunteer. Great. Okay. So just leave your contact if you guys want to buy Sindlin and support a great project. This is, I, 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 almost, I almost grew a tomato last year. It died in the middle. <laughs> This so I am all for learning a little bit more how to do it. Well, this weather has so. been a little tricky, um, you know, moving it into the cold frames that Stephen built. Um, but uh, and we just moved everything, ran them into the basement tonight before we came. But we're also looking at more sustainable things or just reducing electrical costs with some different kinds of lighting situations. But um, we've had everything donated to the, the project. So we've been very what grateful for that. Thank you so Amazing. much. Amazing. May 6th. Great. You see what happens when we actually start speaking to each other? Yes, there's another comment. Go. Hi. I was just talking to Oren over there. Wave at everybody, Oren. And we said, well, how can we increase the ability to have sustainable things in a student multi-story apartment building where they have no access to recycle bins? They have a, a, a bin uh, that they put stuff in and it all goes down into the basement all in the same bin. And he said, well, the management doesn't want to rebuild multiple bins and uh, put up a full recycling system so that they have multiple bins on every floor. Think of all the infrastructure and the cost. And we said, well, how can we get out of that? And the answer was, well, on even days, it's trash. And on odd days, it's recycled. And all they have to do is move the bin in the bottom of the chute uh, in people's uh, uh, multi-story apartment complexes and it would so you put a sign on it that says even days trash odd days recycle so one little idea uh, from the two of us just talking for a few minutes might solve a few problems for these multi-story buildings simple idea great idea thank you so much do we have any more burning suggestions ideas or stories if not, this is the time to tweet your questions or ask your questions. We have an amazing audience, but we also have amazing speakers right here, and they're ready with the microphones to answer uh, any questions you have. So is there anybody ready? And do we have, Joe, do we have a good question? I think we have lots of good questions. Um, let's wait for the first one to pop up on the screen. I'm sure people are tweeting, no? No questions whatsoever. This is, ooh, Greg is asking something. Outstanding turnout, yes, I, I agree. Um, this is an opportunity to, if you are not feeling comfortable in front of a mic, this is the easiest way to ask a question. I think from my end, I wanted to ask a question on how do you balance the many different stakeholder needs? And I know Frank showed the financial, social, environmental, and so on. I know all of your companies go through that. So how do you find the balance between the sometimes competing needs? For example, the market wants you to perform short terms in a very high profitability margins. 
The customers want high quality products for the lowest price. The government wants the most taxes from you. Uh, the employees want the best experience and conditions. And you want also to be a benefit and real positive handprint in society. So how do you balance the different realities, the different demands from stakeholders? Whoever wants to jump in. Yeah, right? Sure, sure, I'll talk about it. Uh, so, so one of the things that we do is uh, we, we do stakeholder outreach. So we, we have, uh, you, you may not have noticed it because while I was sandwiched between the uh, um, beautiful apparel and climbing gear and uh, delicious ice cream, I was also on the main slide sandwiched between some beautiful pictures of food and, uh, and apparel. And it happened to be what we call our materiality matrix that was on the slide in the background. Uh, and that's basically what we do is we talk to our stakeholders and try to figure out, and our stakeholders being employees, investors, customers, uh, the communities in which we operate, to, to ask you know, what's important to them, what do they expect from us, and that begins to inform us on what should be important. And then as a for-profit company, uh, we then challenge ourselves to find economic, economically profitable ways to drive the social and environmental change that our stakeholders expect. And what we find is that uh, while companies have been you know, trying to be profitable for many, many years, uh, if you put the lens of sustainability on an environmental or a social challenge uh, and try to find an economic solution to that, it often uncovers uh, solutions that just plain focusing on dollars does not. Uh, so, so that's kind of the magic of sustainability is looking at it a different way and saying we really want to drive down this waste stream or we really want to drive down this energy consumption. Yeah, we're going to save money on landfill, we're going to save money on, on energy, but with the push to drive an environmental, in that case, um, agenda, we end up finding economic ways that didn't kind of come upon us um, with our innovation processes when we were just looking at just saving dollars. Absolutely. So. And that experience shows up again and again in the best companies. When you put an additional limit, you actually become more creative. We've done this experiment in a few institutes of arts where we ask the students to design a backpack. And when you have no limit, you end up with a beautiful product. But when you put a limit, for example, the least number of parts, because more parts is more waste, right? You cut out all the material and throw out the waste. When you put that limit, least number of parts, the creativity went through the roof immediately. So the limit, in that case, environmental or social limit, actually drives innovation, doesn't reduce it, and you end up with a greater economic outcome. Do we have a question? Yes. Ah, first team at hand. There is a question right here. This is a big group and a big ballroom. So you guys are getting your workout. A couple floor downs. It, uh, it seems to me that um, this crisis we're facing with climate change, in a sense, could also be one of the biggest job creators we've ever seen. Where do you see the future with green jobs and, while at the same time, sustainability? Probably everyone has an opinion on that. Tara, do you want to start? Do you feel that there is a lot of green jobs? available on the market? I do. So I was recently going through the job search after I finished my undergrad and then went on to get my MBA and uh, spent a lot of time applying for jobs and searching for the right jobs. It's tough because you'll, uh, you won't find many jobs that, especially entry level, that are listed as sustainability. You have to get creative in your searches. Um, I found that project management is a really fitting uh, title for someone who has studied and experienced sustainability. Uh, sustainability works in such a system and you, you learn how to think in a system when you're studying sustainability and that's really, it really applies well to the project management field. Sure. Um, 
uh, similarly, you know, sustainability touches everything. You know, it might be very obvious how um, you can talk about sustainability in a supply chain. You're talking about transportation. You're talking about raw materials. Um, it's not always as evident when you're talking about marketing um, or when you're talking about other types of industry. So um, at a company like Patagonia, um, it's what we're all about. So the marketing people are well-versed in sustainability terms. Um, they're not flying out to conferences um, when they can get there on a train. Um, and so it's, it's those sorts of focuses on, on sustainability. Um, it, it touches everything. And, and so I think that um, it, it eventually will become kind of like table, table stakes. Um, everyone's got kind of some experience and knowledge of sustainability um, to start with. Maybe I'll just tag on something. Uh, I think if you're looking for a green job, uh, think about every job as being possible to be a green job. Um, so, so if you're in finance, then you're part of the decision-making uh, body that decides what investments are made, and you get an opportunity to ask questions of, okay, we've got two choices. Um, you know, wh what are the differences in the life cycle impact of these two choices? So you get to layer on a sustainability aspect to your finance job. If you're in sourcing, you get to ask suppliers, uh, well, you're both priced the same, uh, you both have the same service, so I want to understand what you're doing from an environmental standpoint and who has the lowest greenhouse gas impact for what you're going to sell to us. Uh, so you get to put a sustainability lens and, and now your sourcing job is a green job. Uh, so when I think about our company, 19,000 employees, you know, I often get asked how many people are in the sustainability department at Owens Corning, and I always say 19,000, uh, because every job in our company can be a green job. It's just, you know, are you asking the right questions? Are you driving the right decisions? Uh, are, are you trying to make a change through your work? Um, so, so I think it's an opportunity for every role in every company. And in terms of the kind of paradigm, what we're noticing with sustainability is very similar to what happened to quality in the 70s and 80s. Remember in the 70s and 80s when quality was perceived as a trade-off to the cost before Toyota introduced the Kaizen and Lean and so on. The idea was either you have a quality car or you have a cheap car. When Toyota was able to prove that the more you invest in quality, the more cost-efficient you become, quality became everybody's job. It used to be that quality was a little department. Now it's just part of embedded process. It's a standard operating procedure. This is what we're seeing with sustainability, that it's becoming part of literally every process. And in that sense, you are a bit of ahead of the game because not as many people have even basic concept of sustainability entering the job stream right now. Um, which is a great advantage for you. I know there's a hand somewhere shaking on that side. Uh, there's a hand in the, two hands. Yep, let's take those two questions and then we'll try to see if we have more time as people are leaving for their classes, I'm sure. It's 8.45, we're supposed to finish right now. Yes, so there's one, one right in the right row that was the first person up. Thank you for your presentations. My name is Brian. I had a question uh, mainly goes to Katie. Uh, she mentioned investing in the supply chain. And uh, I think probably Sarah can also speak to this. But uh, go through your thoughts and how you've decided to invest in your supply chain in the process for doing that, some of the reasoning. Sure. So you know, with the wool example, we found that no one was doing what we wanted. And, and no one was doing something that we wanted to stand by as a company. And so that we knew that we had to uh, make a co-investment um, and, be, and be a part of that. No one's going to um, lose money on, on getting into something um, when they're not sure where it's going to go. Um, so, so we become a, a partner with um, various companies. We've done it with Wool. Um, we've done it with um, the company that makes the booties on our waders for fishing. Um, we've made some co-investment in materials and tooling. Um, and so it's usually, the decision is usually when, when there's not a product out there that, um, that we want to use or can use, um, but we know someone can, can develop that capability. They just need the capital or, or to be convinced. Um, and so that's kind of how we, we get to that place. Any other comments? Yeah, I think um, for both Patagonia and Jenny's, our supply chain is what and owns Corning too, our supply chain is what sets us apart. It's what makes us unique and a differentiator in the market. 
um, we have to invest in our supply chain or else we're not the same companies. Uh, so I think it, it's part of the core DNA of our company. Yeah, one of the very powerful things that a company can do is uh, create that uh, assurance to a potential supplier, as you were saying, that um, if you do this, you will have a market for it. And that slide that I showed of uh, growing recycled glass content is a very good example of that, where uh, the economic uncertainty to create a recycling business in a city like Columbus is, is fairly high, and it takes a lot of capital to do. Uh, but if we can assure a recycler that, uh, that, that we are a market for their uh, product, then it provides them ability to go out and get funding uh, from investors or whatever. So uh, it's a very symbiotic, symbiotic uh, relationship between a company that has uh, a desired outcome and leaning on the capabilities and interest of suppliers to develop those capabilities, knowing that they've, they've got a, a market. If I could share one more quick comment. Um, another thing we, um, we make sure we do at Patagonia is we share. Um, we share technologies we develop and we share programs. So um, something we got into five years ago was fair trade. Um, and that is where we pay a surcharge on top of every garment we buy from a factory. And that goes into a, a fund that is managed by, democratically by a group of employees. And so they vote on what they want to do with it. Our, uh, in Los Angeles, the t-shirt uh, employees, the factory, the employees of the t-shirt factory decided they wanted it just a, a, a check. They wanted cash. Um, at one of our factories in Sri Lanka, they, it, it funded daycare. Um, so the women were able to continue going to work. Um, another company decided to get raincoats with it. So um, we certify these factories as fair trade. It costs money. It costs us money. It costs the factory money. But then they can make products for any other, for Lululemon, for Under Armour, for Nike, and make it fair trade. And so we've seen kind of a, a proliferation of fair trade throughout uh, the, the apparel industry. And we've kind of been at the forefront of certifying these, um, these companies to do so. So um, we can motivate them by knowing that um, once they do what we need them to do, they can do it for uh, other companies too. Do we have patience for a couple more questions? It's time to wrap up. Aha! <laughs> then we wrap up. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. This is our tradition with the Environmental Professionals Network. We have a certificate of appreciation for all four of our speakers. We have an image of the, uh, tonight's title along with uh, an acknowledgement of our, our appreciation for helping out with the Thank you so much. I feel like we've only just gotten the conversation started, so please feel free to stick around and have some conversations with your new buddies, um, as well as sort of like with each other. Uh, I do think that um, one of the things my takeaway here, and I really appreciated sort of engaging the audience, is the creativity, the spotlight should be on all of you, I think. Um, really, as we go through the theme of this evening, I think is to challenge you all to, uh, uh, to be creative in the sustainability through reinvention. Um, I also sort of say in terms of sort of like sort of the students among you, part of our goal in sort of like highlighting this, and I'm so delighted to have two OSU graduates here, is I really think Ohio State is in a position to sort of populate the future sort of like sustainability leaders out there. If you are an employer looking for talent, we have some amazing students here. And for the students and stuff, I know it's your job to sort of convince us as to how we achieve these goals. So some of you, when you're out in their job searches, it's going to be your chance to sort of explain how we sort of like achieve these goals through your creativity because some of our employers out there don't quite get what has been shared with us here. So you're going to be our greatest ambassadors. For those of you that are, uh, have an interest in future EPN events, I just want to bring to your attention on the back of the program that we have a future event in May as well as in June that we're excited to, to host you on. Uh, without any further ado, though, I want to give a big round of applause to our, our speakers. I'm sure they're available to answer your questions. Have a good evening. Thank you Thank very much. You.